action Well executed, I'm the main attraction Engaging vibes is where I wanna be And chancing light to smiles is all you see <laughs> So I ain't thinking about the next one Snapping pics, they be loving my fashion Great drinks, great friends, and it's flowing well It's a perfect event, shout out Riel I'm gonna invite Alex on the screen to talk about our legal rights as we decide to um, engage in different forms of activism or we're just at home and something might happen. So I'm excited to see you, thank you. And can you hear me? Oh, yep, I can hear you. Okay, great. So yeah, I think my, it's gonna be very quick legal advice mm -hmm. and it's gonna be aimed at um, protesters if you get arrested, but I think it's just good legal advice for anyone. Um, and this is, you know, I'm a former prosecutor which means that I spent years putting people in prisons, uh, but I now think that prison should be torn down. So, but this advice is not about fighting the system. This advice is about if you've already been caught up in the system, sort of what to do. And I think it is, as you said, it's for people who are protesting, but then it's also very good advice for people that are staying home. Yeah. So the first piece of advice is everyone on TV has seen, um, you get that one free phone call when you get arrested. That's a myth. That will never happen. So you oh. will not see a telephone for hours, maybe days. And so the important thing is that you need to have someone, if you're protesting, you need to have someone who's at home who knows what county you're gonna be protesting in, what city, and maybe what facility you're gonna to go to. Mm -hmm. And they know to start calling to figure out where you are if they haven't heard from you. So you should have some sort of agreed period of time. But if, if it's been about four hours and they haven't heard from you, they have to start making some calls. Okay. So really you need someone on the outside that's advocating for you because once you've been arrested, you it's very difficult to advocate for yourself. And they need to know um, what you've been charged with, what your bail is, um, and physically where you are. And if they can't get those answers, they need to call the public defender's office because okay. even if you haven't hired a public defender, the public defender is the best resource if you think a loved one has been arrested. Mm -hmm. What if like you're asking what's the charge or, or whatnot and they're not telling you and they're just like comply, comply, comply. What do you do in that moment? Two things. You call the public defender's office. Okay. But also all jails have inmate searches where you can look up inmates by last name and so you can find out if someone's in a facility and what they've been charged with and but they are taking protesters to non-jail facilities they're just taking really them to sort of warehouses yes and so that is good information to know about the online system in your general life but as far as protesting you want to try to figure out where they're taking protesters specifically mm -hmm. and the more people that can call about you in particular, you want people on the outside advocating for you to figure out all that information. But again, the next step would be the public defender. Okay. I didn't mean to, the, that, that just- No, 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 no. Then, like, Oh my goodness, I've seen videos where like, they aren't saying, they're like, what am I getting charged for? They're just like, comply, do this, do this, you know? I don't and think like, I didn't even know, know that they were taking them to like non-jails. What? I didn't know that they were taking the protesters to like places that weren't jails. Like, I mean, I didn't, I didn't hear that. Wow. Yes. So you need to, and the person that gets arrested, you may not know what you're charged with. That's why it's important for the outside person to figure it out because your bail amount is based on what you're charged with. Also, if they charge you with a felony, they are legally allowed to take your DNA and then your DNA is in the system. And so they're always looking for felonies to charge mm -hmm. you with. The other thing that you need to know is um, if you make any calls in jails, all jail calls and prison calls are recorded. And the systems will tell you that. They'll say this call is being recorded. Mm -hmm. But what's really important is not only should you not talk about your crime or the allegations or anything incriminating, you also, if you're a protester, don't talk with your friends about where they're gonna protest the next day or what signs they're gonna be holding or what their strategies are because cops are listening to those phone calls to know where protesters are gonna be the next day. Mm. So you should talk on the phone as little as possible. Yeah. Then the other two things I want to talk about are about what you should carry with you if you're going protesting. 
So the first thing is if you take any sort of medication, you should carry a week's worth of that medication with you if you're going protesting. That is because jails will not give you medication, even if you're legally prescribed it, unless they can confirm that you have a prescription. Mm. You don't want any time in between your medication and getting it. So you want to bring in your prescription. The other thing is jails. But not with your label, but not with your name on it. Well, no, no, no. With your name on it's fine. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, you want your prescription in your pocket or in a backpack or in a fanny pack. You want your prescription. Okay. And then for and one week's worth of medication at least. I know some medications have to be um, refrigerated, for example, but if possible, bring medication. The other thing is jails are very dangerous places. People Mm -hmm. die in jails. People uh, commit suicide in jails. People get assaulted in jails. Mm. So you do not want to stay in a jail, right? You want to get out as quickly as possible. But the other thing is if something bad happens to you in jail, you want to sue, right? You you want to sue the jail facility. Mm -hmm. And so if you are showing up to the jail with your correct medication and you are, you're doing your part, that makes your case to sue much, much stronger. Okay. So you want to look out for yourself. And similarly, the advice has always been, do not talk to cops. That's the advice. Mm -hmm. Never Mm -hmm. talk to cops. Yeah. (laughs) But as you're getting arrested, if you have a pre-existing medical condition, you need to be informing the cop of that every second of the way. Okay. Because if they ignore that, you get to sue them. So if you're pregnant, if you have migraines, if you're diabetic, just be telling them consistently and tell them that at the jail. So be silent except for medical conditions. Okay, that makes sense. Yes. Um, Then the next thing that you should bring with you when you're protesting or if you're arrested in general Mm -hmm. is proof that you live in the state where you're arrested. So if you, for example, are a student Mm -hmm. and you don't live in a state where you attend school and you are arrested protesting and your driver's license is an out of state driver's license, they may not give you a bond because they think that you're a flight risk. Oh, you want to have proof that you live in the state where you're arrested, that you're not a flight risk. So that can be a student ID, that can be mail, that could be bills, but proof that you live in that state. Yeah. And then the last two things mm-hmm. are about when you get out. Mm-hmm. So when you get out, if there are no charges filed, then you should consider suing the police. Okay. And that would be a civil lawsuit. So you're looking for a civil attorney. It's not criminal. And then those type of cases, you should not be paying a dollar. How it works is the attorney makes money once the police force pays money. So that would be free for you to sue the police. And it's a civil lawyer. And then the second thing is you should get your arrest expunged because it's on your criminal history that you've been arrested. And so, and also it probably says something like disturbing the peace or something that makes you look not great. Yeah. Like right. menacing or something. Yeah. Right. Is, is, it, right. is exactly. it expensive? Like, like, yeah. Is it an expensive process to, yeah, get exposed? So the amount of money can vary, mm-hmm. but it should be free. And sometimes it's as little as it's free or it's $25. It can be as okay. much as $200. Okay. But then they do accept payment plans frequently. And the forms for expungements can frequently be found at the district attorneys, either their offices or on their websites. And if you can't find the expungement forms, the public defender's office will have that. Unfortunately, expungements take about two years to be processed. So once you get arrested, that's something that you want to be doing right away. Wow. Because that would impact your job, like employment for two, like if you're trying to find a new job for two years, unless you're already somewhere, I'm sorry, not to distract you. That's crazy. Two years. And that could be just because like I was at a protest and they, I got swept up in this. Yes. And you know, disturbing the peace or whatever they say, like, I, I, wow. And then you're having to explain that to everybody. And, And that's not common knowledge. Like, I don't think like you don't, that's not something we talk about in the workforce. Like, yeah, this could happen. So like we should normalize that or like, or anything like, wow. In general though, there are a lot of nonprofits that help people to expunge their record. So 
once you've been convicted of a crime, it gets both more expensive and more complicated. And so you should look into a nonprofit group that would help you with expungements, but it's worth it to expunge your record. Awesome. And um, if you, so, okay. What happens if you're like, we see a lot of videos out where like people are kind of harassing other people that are in the pool. We saw that, or, you know, bird watching or whatever it is like how how what can we do in those moments you know what have you seen i mean of course it's just like yeah yeah so i cannot give advice mm -hmm. for how to safely interact with the police because i think that frankly all black people from when they're very small teach each other and teach their children say this do this keep your hands in the right places and the truth is that no one that is harmed by police did something wrong, if that makes yeah. sense. Like, you know, and and so frequently, like in the cases where someone has lunged or done something, there's a mental illness there. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to say that you can do. Or, I mean, or like against the other person that's like har harassing, you. like, you know, the person that's making a scene. Like, because I feel like if I'm getting impacted by the fact that, like, you know what I mean? There should be something. Or someone like you have a neighbor that's harassing you nonstop, you know, like what can you do to, you know, yeah. make sure that, yeah. So the thing to do, there's two real things you can do. So harassment requires two acts. So one, someone doing one thing to you mm -hmm. is usually not enough to be harassed. It requires two acts and then there has to be intention to harass. So you have to be able to prove from the conduct that it's intentionally harassing. And so, for example, if someone, let's say, an easy example, someone texts you, and, you know, this happens in domestic violence cases where someone texts you and says, baby, I want you back, like, and if you don't come back to me, I'm going to kick you in the head. And then their next text, so a week later, is like, I drove by your house five times, you're not home, are you with a different boy? So that's like harassing. Yeah. The thing to do is to establish a line by, via text and say, you're harassing me. If you text me more, you know, I'm going to take steps. So you're like telling them, I consider this harassment, anything afterwards, I'm considering harassment. So you have to notify the person that's harassing that this is okay. harassing, hopefully in writing. Okay. And then from there, your next step, um, you know, I don't want to tell people to go to the police, but I think a, a tool that people need to know about mm -hmm. is you can walk into a police station and say, I want to file a report, not to press criminal charges, but just to establish a record mm -hmm. so that I can take future action. So what you do is you get them, you'll get an officer who is not in, he's not, he or she is not wearing a gun. It's the person that sits behind the front desk at a police station. So this is, this is an officer that works at the desk. Mm -hmm. They will write a police report. It's an it's a official police report, but the intention is not to bring charges. And then what I would do is I would get a copy of that report because you're entitled to a copy of it. And then you can take it in your life to wherever you're being harassed. So, for example, if you're being harassed at work, you say, yeah. look, and you use that piece of paper to gain legitimacy at your work, at your apartment complex, anything like this. Okay. So that is, that is um, the most basic about harassment. If it is with a phone, I will say that is another crime, at least in the state of Georgia, which is when you're using a telephone to harass them or using technology to harass them, that's actually a different crime. So that becomes a crime. In the Amy Cooper video, which we all watched, mm -hmm. she is calling and doing a false report of a crime. Mm -hmm. False report of a crime is a crime in some states. However, in some states, you actually have to file the police report, which means that you have to meet with the police officer and do the report. So it's a little bit state specific. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition with harassment, I think the best thing to do is try to look for a non-police authority. So whether it's an HOA, a apartment complex management, um, whether it's a school administration, I will say students have so many rights inside of school. So if you are a student being harassed, you have tons and tons of rights because really, yeah, you have a legal right to go to school and get an education. So if anything is stopping that, they have a, you have a lot of abilities. Mm -hmm. um, I think in general, my best piece of advice is to have an ally. So if you're being arrested, you want an ally on the outside calling for you. Mm -hmm. And then similarly, I think if you're being harassed or you're experiencing this, frankly, I think my advice boils down 
and obviously it's very self-serving advice to having like a white lawyer friend, like a yeah. white lawyer friend who feels like the exact amount of white guilt to like, <laughs> <laughs> right. because I think with harassment, going to your management company and saying, my lawyer friend wrote this letter, we really don't want to escalate it, mm-hmm. but here's a letter. And um, you can have a lawyer write a cease and desist letter, things like that. So I think looking for non-police alternatives to those solutions, but just know you can go to a police station in the middle of the day and ask them to write out a report and say, I don't want charges filed. I just want to report as a record. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a really good thing to do if you are having like any sort of weird situations with romantic partners, anything where you don't yeah. want to fight for the police. That's like a good idea. And then also you want to tell them in writing, I consider this harassment. So any continued communication is harassment. And then I think you also just want to tell as many people as possible. So if someone's harassing you, use the example of someone in your apartment com- complex. You want to tell the management company. You want to find neighbor allies. You want to sort of build a community where other people will take your side. Because I think all too often black people are um, intentionally isolated and then mm-hmm. they have to say what happened to them. And so you need to be in the habit of having people have your back and document, document, document. So save every single text, um, you know, screenshot everything, send contemporaneous emails. So email Mm -hmm. your mom and say, mom, the neighbor harassed me again, things like that. That makes sense. Um, Going back to if someone's arrested, when can a police like search their phone, like, or go through their phone? Great question. So there's been a lot of articles going around saying that protesters need to deactivate facial recognition. Mm -hmm. So, Technically, legally, officers cannot grab your phone, hold it up to your face, and open it. But Mm -hmm. realistically, they are going to do that. Same with a thumbprint. So after the fact, your lawyer lawyer will argue that that was an illegal search, Mm -hmm. but they are going to do that. So I completely agree with the advice. You need to deactivate uh, your facial recognition or your fingerprint recognition. You need to have a password-protected phone. I would go a step farther. Frankly, Mm -hmm. I don't think that this is crazy advice in today's America. I would either, you can password protect just your texting app on your phone. Oh. Yes, and if you choose not to do that, you can use apps. I like the app Line, Mm L-I-N-E, which is password protected and encrypted. And when they, if they arrest you, and let's say they think you did something really, really bad, so they're gonna take your phone and duplicate it, they will not get anything that's on those apps. So I think it is best practices to um, keep everything off your phone. You wanna delete old text messages, delete photos, and just put all that stuff on the cloud that has a password. Mm -hmm. But the answer is that if your phone is password protected, they need a court order to get that password from you Mm -hmm. and then put in the phone. They cannot force you to give you that password. Can I ask you one more question since I have you? If people are interested in criminal justice reform, what's the next steps that they can take? So there's two next steps that they can take. So one is what I would call the mainstream one. And I think we have to pursue this even as we're pursuing step two. So step one is vote for progressive sheriffs and district attorneys. Police chiefs are not elected. So sheriffs and district attorneys are. And so you're looking for candidates who want to um, the promise that they won't cooperate with ICE. They promise that they'll get rid of solitary confinement. They promise that they won't prosecute simple marijuana. Those are the signs that someone is a progressive prosecutor and sheriff. Mm. Um, that's the first thing. Just like vote and vote for, you know, progressive candidates. And really, people don't pay attention to those races, and those are the races that are important to pay attention to. Mm-hmm. And I will say that a vast majority of the people that are in jails and prisons in America are in state facilities. So what's really exciting about that is if you are just a single volunteer, it's much easier to make a difference on the state system. So find out who your local person is. And what I like to do is everyone that I meet that says that they're very interested in criminal justice reform, I say, oh really, who's your sheriff? Who's your district attorney? Okay. So those are very important. Then the next thing is we need to completely eradicate the criminal justice system, period. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to tell you a fact, and it is the most chilling fact, Mm -hmm. like when you really think about it, which is that one in 13 people in my state, so I live in Georgia, Mm -hmm. one in 13 people are under some sort of supervision, state supervision. So that means that they're in prison, they're in parole, um, they're 
on wow. her hand, something. So somehow someone is controlling their movements. One in 13, it's, it's preposterous. And that's like, I feel like classroom sizes are bigger than that, you know, in the average class, like any class, any grade, any school is bigger than 13. I can't think of another statistic that if, if one in 13 people were experiencing something, we wouldn't be completely freaked out because that's yeah. one in 13 people are criminals and that's just like not true. Yeah. So, yeah. So when you talk to people about eradicating or just tearing down the criminal justice system, they're going to be freaked out. Mm -hmm. So how I like to have this conversation is two thirds of the people in jails are mentally ill and half of the people in prisons are mentally ill. Yes. And the rise of mass incarceration perfectly correlates with us defunding mental health institutions in the eighties. Yeah. Now mental in health institutions were bad, right? Like people were mistreated. But we need facilities for people to go that are mentally ill. And also yeah. police officers, this is this is like the nice way to talk about police officers. We're asking too much of them. They are not mental health care workers. It's not fair to them. Let's let's take that off their their you know, <laughs> we don't need to do that. And so what we need to be doing is we need to hire mental health first responders. Mm -hmm. Because one of my saddest cases was a man a, a grown man attacked his father with a sword. His father knew he was mentally ill, but didn't know what to do, so he called the cops. And then that man is in prison for 10 years. And the dad yeah. didn't want that. Right. So what do you do? And so that man should be in a facility that's working to get him stable so that he can be released. So first, yeah. de-invest from police, invest in mental health resources. Yep. Um, the other thing is that police have become far too militarized. And so we have to fight that, which is you can say, I'm fine with police. I just don't think they should have tanks. Yeah. Um, because when you show up with tanks, it means that you're preparing for war. Yeah. Right. So I think you can accomplish both things at once. You can tell people to vote, but you also have to say that the entire system is broken and there's actually no way to fix it. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is we need to start from scratch and build things. We need to have mental health facilities. We need to have first responders that are not police, that are not armed. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to let communities determine how much level of policing they want. So they actually are inviting the police in and saying yeah. the level that we want. Um, and I mean, I think, and I think that's really important. Like, I think even going back to what you're saying, like of, of us overall defunding mental health um, in the 80s and like and shifting towards being more harder on like crime, hard on crime kind of a stance, you know, and it's like even if the facilities weren't great, it's, you can go better. You can say, hey, this is not good. Let's not abandon the fact that we know that people are mentally ill or like are dealing with things. And I think like, and this is something we're gonna talk about later about like domestic abuse and child abuse. A lot of times those things are also like actual problems aren't labeled as problems, you know? And then there's things that are labeled as problems that we're focusing on that aren't really aren't. And um, I know that we talked, you talked about decriminalizing like um, marijuana or like small marijuana use or whatnot. The first time I actually encountered anybody like in my life smoking weed or whatnot was when I was babysitting up north for white families, but they were so wealthy that it was kind of like, oh, well, you're nannying, you're babysitting them. We're going to go to the backyard and have friends. And for someone who like grew up like, this is the worst thing you could ever do. Like, this is the gateway drug. This is going to make your life crazy. And to see like, and then I saw it so many other places like nannying in that community around like, wow, like it's it's not only normalized, but at a point like you become so wealthy that it's fine, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's a meme that's going around, but basically I want to live in a world where everyone is treated like a rich white kid because yeah. <laughs> Because people talk about destroying the police like it's impossible, but there are not police in rich neighborhoods. Um, when people have disagreements and they're rich, they don't call the police. They yeah. quietly figure it out. Um, and frankly, when black people do that, when they take back justice and they figure things out in their communities, then they're told that they're not dealing with problems. And yeah. so I think that so the, the thing in America that we don't talk about is we criminalize everything we're all about freedom but it's yeah. like you can't loiter you can't pee in public you, none of these should be crimes yeah so because once you get once you get caught up in the system once then it spirals 
And so we need to literally go through the law book and just cross out crimes over and over again. There is a crime in Georgia, it's a felony, and it's called terroristic threats and acts, mm -hmm. which is if you threaten to kill someone, you can go to prison for five years. So th I think about this crime all the time. Think about how many times in your life you've said, I'm going to kill you. Are you right. serious? Like all that could be a crime. I've seen it. Like, or like, I'm like, I know I'm, I'm like, I've watched a <laughs> AE show or whatever. Like if there's like someone tell that and not seriously, but just like being frustrated or angry. Wow. But also shoplifting should not be a crime. Mm -hmm. Businesses should be able to handle that internally. Um, frankly, credit card theft, like I've been the victim of credit card theft. Credit card companies run their own internal investigations where they prosecute people. So why are the police redoing that work? So I mean, I know yeah. this sounds crazy, but we need to get rid of laws, period. Yeah, and simplify it and go back to, and, and thinking about the communities at hand. So I promise you this is my last question. No, I, I, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> what's one thing that you wish like you either had known back then when you were actually like practicing, you know, when you were a prosecutor, that you wish other prosecutors know, like who are now filling your old shoes? It's hmm. a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I really, really wish I had known what an advantage rich people have. So we talk about it in the criminal justice context, which is that rich people hire really good lawyers. And, but what we don't talk about is rich people hire good lawyers which means that their lawyers make sure that they're dressed up in a nice suit every single time they come to court. Yeah. And then they also, their lawyers hang out with my boss, the district attorney. And so mm -hmm. he's calling my boss. Mm -hmm. um, and they also, they can hire enough lawyers that they can bury you. Mm -hmm. And so I think if people knew for one minute how, how terrible the disparity is between how rich people and poor people are treated, it would discuss them. And the easiest way to explain that is under Trump's reign, I won't call it administration, right. Trump, <laughs> the number of, so this is just federal cases because I was a federal prosecutor, the number of like drug and violent crime cases has gone up, it's at its highest level ever. The number of white collar cases, so these are people stealing money from people's pension accounts, from like- That has a way bigger effect, yeah. Lessons. Lowest level ever. And so, so just, I guess I thought that I could look at every single case and be fair, and in hindsight, the system is so much more rigged than that, and I think I thought by being a good person, I think it's the, it is the Amy Cooper, which is like, I'm a special white person, like I, I care and you're so wrong because the system is so racist and so you can't actually be a good person mm -hmm. inside of the system. So my whole life, and we went to the same college, I think our college yeah. teaches us a little bit, which is like work inside the system to change yeah. it. And it's like, no, no. You got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like I would never tell a classmate to become a prosecutor. I would, you know, never be a prosecutor again. And so I really think we can't sacrifice good people to being prosecutors anymore. We have to tell them the only option is to fight against the system. And I used yeah. to think I had to work inside the system to understand the system so I could dismantle it. Yep, and you, you're trained that. You're trained that. Yeah. No. You know, isn't system, it like how long do you stay in this in the system and not be like <laughs> like you're a cog at some point and you're like making it keep going forward even when you're trying to fight it? Like I, I a thousand percent uh, understand. I don't know if you know the Lovett School. Yeah. Yeah, I went there. I went to MLK. Um, then I went to Lovett School, which th that's the story I bring up for the education panel because the Lovett School did not accept any of my MLK IB program credit. Like they took my prep school credit from up north, two years in the uh, public school down there. They're like, nope. That was the first time I saw like people come in and like, oh yeah, I crashed a car, nothing happened. You like totaled it, like walked away from the my no points on my like my license fine or i had the 600 dollars crazy speeding ticket because they had other ones before we went in there we paid some amount and we're fine like or and or the fact that they have boats and i didn't know that they were like i was like there's police on the water like, <laughs> like you can get a ticket out there like because that's just not my world i didn't 
I didn't even know that like kids had access to just have votes to be out there and stuff. But in the response is, well, you know, it's this time of year. Y'all are all coming out to the lake and whatever. So, and it's not the kids. It's, it's on the, it's on the system for teaching them that it's normal. But then when you go back to school and you have conversations with other people, like, or like me, and that's not normal. And it's like, well, maybe you just don't have enough money. Like maybe it's a you thing or something. And, and it creates that like idea for when you could see to grow and you become professionals or whatnot. And like, that bias that you have of like how normal it is and how easy it is to work with the police or talk to them and it'll be figured out or solved, you know? Yeah. The other thing is, and this relates to your story, I swear, is yeah. I ran a drug court program when I was a prosecutor, which sounds like a great thing, right? It's, it means if you have a mental health problem and a drug problem, you can get help on the outside and not go to jail, right? Mm -hmm. And our program was overwhelmingly white and we could not figure out why because our applicants were 50 50 right mm -hmm. and it was because you had to have steady transportation to the court and like and it was a lot of court so you needed like a car that worked yeah. every day of the week oh wow and we couldn't quite figure out why the what that problem was right because frankly if you're like a drug dealer and you have a mental health issue because that's who this court served you probably like don't have a car that works. So like, you know, you, you have some life issues. So like yeah. why were the white people having these cars? And it was because we have prosecuted and incarcerated black people in this country at such high rates mm -hmm. that we intentionally have destroyed their safety net. And so it is not just you, the black person that needs a ride. It's every neighbor, cousin, sister. Yep. And yep. so they don't have the resources to invest in saving the person that gets stuck in the system. So what white people have, but also I will say rich black people, is mm -hmm. when they when their son gets arrested, they show up and they say, I will spend all of the time and the money, so it's time and money, to get little Trevor out, right? Yeah. But you can't do that if your whole community is being arrested and they're under some sort of probation, parole. And the other thing is all of these- systems, And the trauma, I'm sorry, there's trauma around that too. Like. I'm not trying. I'm not trying to make uh, stop your story at all. No. Like, I remember growing up and seeing young black kids in my neighborhood. Indicator, where's greater? Seeing like young black kids that are being arrested because they were found to have a joint on them. Which at that point, again, which why later on when I was I saw it, saw it, not just heard it about it. It freaked me out that people were so cavalier because I'm like, this person was in sixth grade and they went to juvie and then they went here. You know, or all of us all, because again, like at that time it was the second wealthiest black community. So like there is some kind of like a little bit like of elitism in there. So it's kind of like socially, like that's a bad kid or that's a bad family that came in from this program that allowed them in our neighborhood, you know, whatever. And versus understanding the system, because like sometimes you can also buy into it. Like if you don't, if you're fortunate to be black and not have to deal with the police system or criminal system at all, then sometimes you can feel like, well, I've been lucky this long, so it can't, maybe it's where they are or something about their lifestyle, you know? And then of course you do see like a lot of videos, you're like, well, obviously that's blatant or whatnot, but I, I do remember growing up and there being like some sense of, well, that's a bad apple versus being like, the system's really messed up, that's a kid. Like even yeah. if he did have it, why aren't you talking to him about it? Why aren't you trying to teach him or whatever? or? Right. So there's that saying where like black parents will beat you harder because like they're trying to protect you from the outside yeah. world. Yeah. And I see that a lot in the criminal justice system where these black parents would show up with their kids who have messed up once and they will like apologize to their judge about their son that's a screw up or yeah. they won't even show up because they're pissed at him. Yeah. White, white parents like that kid could have killed someone with his car and they are there. They are making apologies for him. Yeah. And I truly think black people have like need to learn from that, which is like we are no longer surrendering any of our kids to the system. And yeah. even if my son Greg, who's black, killed five people with a car, mm -hmm. I am defending him. Mm -hmm. I'm showing up because I'm protecting. I'm protecting our community. I'm protecting our community. And I know that sounds crazy, but I think the like, can I see the manager Karen thing? White people bring it with them to the court system and they get results and i think black people are too quick to want to punish their own kids to protect them and i think they think somehow the system is going to be just and it's not so you need it's to keep not. your son away from the system or your daughter so yeah
Yeah. Thank you so much. I feel like this was a much like this was a very rich conversation. I it's very timely too. So I really appreciate you like hopping on. I um for something I almost missed. <laughs> like a, no, a no, no, no. I, I thought I think like a moment. activism panel should be postponed. But if you're protesting, you know, yeah, don't you to get your phone call. You need to have someone on the outside that's figuring out where you are. So yes. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any last um last comments? Anything else? Thank you. I'm going to put my phone number here in the chat and basically, and people do this to me all the time. If you get arrested, if your son or daughter gets arrested, a loved one, I can help you figure out what bail you need to do, what bond you need to do, things like that. Because the truth is it's very overwhelming. And so if you have any criminal justice questions, call me or text me and I am more than happy to help you. I only live and practice in Georgia, so I probably mm -hmm. won't be able to personally help you, but I know a bunch of lawyers across the country. And so hopefully I can find you a lawyer or tell you who to call. Um, so yeah, that's my general advice. But um, you know, don't talk to the police. Yeah. <laughs> Only Bye. this is your medicine. Tell them about right. your medicine. Well, and medicine. That's, that's it. it. <laughs> thank but you. But thank you so much for putting this together, Gabrielle. It was I. I listened to the COVID panel. It was wonderful. Really informative. I hope you keep listening and hop on the following weeks. I'm going to. I really appreciate. It. Thank you.